Before we begin this episode of Potterless, I just wanted to give a sincere thank you to everyone that's shown support of this podcast thus far. Thanks to everyone that's shown the podcast love on Twitter. Thank you to all of you guys who have left reviews on iTunes. And thanks to anyone that has just said anything nice about this podcast. It's making me really happy to know that people are liking it and sharing it with their friends. So thank you guys so much. And without further ado, let's get into the first episode about Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. To another episode of Potterless, the tale of a 24 year old man reading a series of children's novels. I am blessed and honored to be joined by the internet's She's So Mickey, Amanda McLaughlin. Amanda, why don't Yay! you say hello to the world? Hello, world. This is actually checking off an item on my bucket list, which oh. I, I recently made a list of 100 things that I want to do in my life. And one of uh-huh. those was to guest star on someone else's podcast uh, oh my besides my own. So, hey, you know, you got you got number one out of the way. Awesome. Well, I'm glad. So yes, everyone, Amanda is a lovely friend of mine that I know from YouTube, and she has her own podcast, Spirits, right? That's the name of it? Yeah, Drunken okay. Dive into Myths and Legends. We get drunk Great and, times. and talk about mythology. <laughs> what what better could there be except being sober and talking about Harry Potter, which we're doing right now? Honestly, um, nothing. My podcast is half, <laughs> is half about Harry Potter anyway. <laughs> oh, beautiful. You're the perfect as half. So yes. for everyone that is unaware, we are now beginning chapter two, uh, Harry Potter, or book number two. That's it. Harry Potter and the Chamber. Chamber of Secrets, which I, for the longest time, thought was Harry Potter and the Chamber Pot of Secrets. So this nice. already shows how much I know. Uh, there are some there are some bathroom continuities that are going to be there happening. Is. So not bad. <laughs> Yeah, so my my initial knowledge of this movie was or of this book is just zero because uh, I when I did a little episode of recording everything before reading any page of any book, oh amazing! I, everything that I thought was in book two was in book one. I, I was see. convinced that book two had the giant troll and the three headed dog, and I was convinced that book one had the giant snake at the end. So yeah. the only thing I know that happens in this one is that there's a giant snake at the end, and I don't remember anything that happened in the movie clearly as I've learned as I've read through the book. So. So yeah. let's let's talk about the first half of this novel. I definitely mix them up as well. One and two. <laughs> it, it doesn't help that the book number one had a different name in the UK release than it did in the yeah. US. And before the movies came out, that like that befuddled booksellers. So it's always been confusing. They're like words that aren't common. Like it, it's very unclear. Then there's okay, Azkaban. That's number three. We know that. Yeah, has it ever been resolved of why it's a philosopher versus sorcerer? I feel like those are two very different professions. Uh, I think the the marketing team at Scholastic or whatever the initial publisher was was like Psh, Americans. They don't know what philosopher means, um, but it is <laughs> it is a little bit different actually. As I was reading chapter one uh, to start at the beginning, I noticed that Mr. Vernon's dinner guest is called a builder, which we don't have here in America. Oh. We call them construction workers, you know, yeah. engineers. Like you know, just there's different words. The the category of builder is not a thing, and it is in the UK. Interesting. Okay, that's a little fun fact. Yeah. Well, as you mentioned, chapter one, which is called the worst birthday. My initial it really thought, is. <laughs> my initial thought was, how can there be a birthday worse than the one last, you know, any previous year yeah. when he lived with literally evil incarnate? I guess he didn't know any better. Yeah, <laughs> but then two pages in, I was like, oh, he's back with the family. This is yeah. why it's the worst birthday. Yeah, exactly. So basically, everyone's still the same. Dudley tells Harry to pass a frying pan so we can eat more bacon. This is a common theme amongst the Dursley family. And Dudley's, uh, Dudley's mom is alarmed that he is not eating enough, which yes. was just like, wow, like JKR is really digging in deep to the fat theme here. <laughs> she really she really goes over the top. Borderline yeah. uncomfortable at some points. For um, sure. So. So Dudley asks Harry to pass more bacon, and then Harry says the very common phrase, you forgot to say the magic word. Which I gasped out loud <laughs> at. I held the book in my hand, looked up, and went, <gasps> because Harry's being so sassy. I think that's something we, we lose in the in the movie adaptations. Oh, definitely. Definitely is, is Harry's sort of, like, wit and, you know, need to, like, turn the knife a little bit. Um, yeah. But him saying you forgot the magic word, I was like, holy moly, Harry, you're being really sassy. Yeah, when, I, when he first that I was like, oh, he's being really sassy. And I didn't even think of the implication because the whole family flips shit on Harry because yeah. he said the word magic. And I didn't even realize that until they started freaking out. Neither did Harry. Right. Uh, he, he was like, oh, guys, this is a thing that every human says. And they just 
decided to give him detention or whatever, you know, yeah. ground him further, which I don't know how they can. I know. Like, they, <laughs> I, that's another note I made. Like, they padlocked Hedwig into her cage for three months. How does she yeah. poop? How does she fly? What does she eat? I'm really concerned it's, about her. It's like sincere levels of animal cruelty. I know. I know. <laughs> but uh, on, a, on a more serious note, I, I did remember rereading this for the first time in, in you know, 10 years or so, that mm-hmm. these first few chapters, you'll notice throughout the book, that we always get a glimpse of Harry pre Hogwarts, right, for the school year. Um, yes. And they're some of my favorite chapters in the whole series. Just that sort of sudden shock of like after eight or nine months and being immersed in the wizarding world with its ups and downs, and it's like so texturally rich, and there's people all around him, people know him, um, you know, to go back into this like <laughs> hyperbaric chamber of, you yeah. know, nothingness in, in whatever Sussex. Um, it really, it felt quite. Uh, quite relatable as a kid on summer break yeah. you know sitting no, here with a magic good. book right exactly it's like it's funny it's like the opposite where you like love summer and hate school harry's yeah. the complete opposite because he lives with the worst people Which, ever as a nerd <laughs> obviously i really agree with i was like yeah hermione like you have to go on the hold list for hogwarts of history i feel that pain <laughs> yeah as we move on through the chapter the narrator describes that harry really misses hogwarts and he basically, the narrator just reminds you of everything that happened in book one. Con- very conveniently. Very conveniently. Which I recap. noticed, you know, as you go on, they will not do in future books because no Good. one picks I... up book three of a series and is like, oh, I wonder what this is. Not to mention Harry Potter. Yeah, exactly. So I'm glad I'm glad that that stops because <laughs> I was pretty annoyed that it took like two pages. I was like, okay, narrator, heavy uh, handing, it, like it. throwing point, the plot. Including, including the phrase, his dead mother. And I was like, wow, like we're yeah. really going oh, for it here. Oh, yeah. JK doesn't mess around. No. At all. Like, JK's playing no games. Yeah. I have the JK's very vicious describing the Dursleys. Quote, yes. Vernon was necklace, Petunia was horse-faced, and Dudley was porky. So she's going <laughs> super ruthless on him. Um, and she it's is. Harry's 12th birthday. <laughs> what and were you going to say? I was going to say they're also quite funny. They were funnier. Like the, the humor of their interactions was was funnier than I expected. Um, J.K. Rowling, as a as a writer, we find out like later in her career, loves sort of satirizing the image conscious class politics of England. Like her the, the novel that she wrote after finishing Harry Potter was all about the like politics of a small town and people being polite to each other's faces, but not in reality. And so the Dursleys like rehearsing compliments for their guests right, just made me yeah. laugh it was great <laughs> no I, d- I did think it was good i i had recently just watched the first movie uh in prep you know for use of this podcast and i was upset of how like it seemed like the, they didn't do a very good job of portraying how evil the dursleys were and mm-hmm. how They're like bad the situation was yeah, yeah they, d- they didn't like make them look dumb enough or evil enough yeah my knowledge of them was just from the movie i was like oh they're really bad and they make how you live under the stairs but in the first book it's like oh wow these are like terrible people and yeah petunia has serious baggage and family issues so yeah. i like that i like that the books kind of start with it because it's it, it gives you more background into harry's life the, it absolutely and also as he you know as the stakes keep getting higher and you know the battles that harry has to fight keep getting more serious you realize that like at a certain point he's a man with nothing to lose you know in, in yeah. a way and like and over time you see sort of him you know realize that there there is stuff to hang on to and that there is stuff that he wants to preserve so sort of seeing his character journey like this is where he comes from as a 12 year old like freaking someone called child services come on people yes definitely so it's harry's 12th birthday and they don't care about that because they're having some fancy person over for dinner this builder of sorts Harry sings happy birthday to himself, so which sad. is depressing, <laughs> so depressing. The saddest. <laughs> it's also, notice that it's sunny in England, which means doom must be imminent. Like, I was out to the sunny garden and I, I said, oh shit, like something wrong is going to happen. <laughs> like, oh no, this isn't good. It's like in uh, a very recent episode of uh, Game of Thrones that came on, I won't spoil anything, but there was very happy people and I was like, oh, these people are too happy. Exactly. They have to die. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So, um, Harry's also really sad that he hasn't heard from Ron or Hermione at all. Uh, and my initial thought is no, they're hiding the letters clearly. Uh, yeah. But we'll learn later who hides them. Uh, but he's like, I can't believe they didn't write to me, even though he's had a history of people hiding letters from him. So, <laughs> However, he doesn't I mean, think of that. Wouldn't that be your worst fear that you leave and everyone forgets about you like it was all a dream? Yeah, but I'm the most famous person ever. I know. And I defeated. I know. 
literally Satan just by <laughs> being a baby. I know. <laughs> I didn't amazing. do anything. He just couldn't kill just me. You wait. Oh man, I'm so excited. So he's he's outside and he sees eyes pop out of a bush and stare at him and he oh, doesn't yeah. know what exactly is going on. Harry and Dudley have a conversation back and forth and Harry, like you said, super snarky and he pretends to do a magic trick to Dudley. It was and awesome. That's a Big no-no, huge no-no for Petunia. She ends up uh, punishing Harry by making him do a million chores in preparation for this fancy person coming over, which he was going to do anyway, right? I, like, know, I don't, I, know. I don't understand why they're like, oh, Harry, he's now like, you have to do he's chores. He's like scripted as a servant anyway. Yeah, it's like he was going to do them. So he has to do all he has to do all the chores, and then he has to stay locked in his room. Silent. Uh, when, being silent. the operative horde, which yes. means you know that something is going to go oh, wrong. Oh, yeah. Oh, because Vernon tells him like five different times that he needs to go into his room and be silent. Like you're not even here, right? Yeah, I was like, so something's going to be in his room and then it's going to be loud. And the last sentence of chapter one is, someone was on Harry's bed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Also, just just to note that the, the guest um, is from Vernon's Work, which is a drill-making company. And oh. I just laughed at the sort of phallic implications. Listen, guys, that's an English <laughs> major. I used to like reading into context clues. Um, I was like, what are you compensating oh. for, Vernon? Oh, so good. So chapter two, Dobby's warning. This is where I'm going to make every Harry Potter fan mad because Dobby is the most annoying character ever. He is sort of the worst. Like, maybe his heart's in the right place. Okay, I haven't gotten to the point where he, like, does something redeemable because I'm only halfway through exactly. book two. And so far, no, he's the worst an person ever. Yeah, he's, like, worse than Peeves. I hate him. And, <laughs> and everyone's like, don't say bad things about Dobby. He's so good. And people get sad on like the day he died or whatever. I don't, he better have a huge turnaround in the end of this book because he's the worst. Let's see why he's the worst. Yeah, the single character in the Harry Potter universe that you, you least want to encounter during an important dinner party. Which is funny because he's a, he's a servant, ostensibly. But yeah. in, in reality, he like fucks things up on a grand scale. Can I say fuck? Is that okay? Oh, you can say anything. Okay. Yo, we're, I'm not, there's no bleeping. This is an expletive marked podcast on iTunes. So Mine too. Join the club. <laughs> so he says he's a house elf. He cries like tears of joy when Harry tells him to sit because he thinks Harry's the coolest person ever, which he is. Yeah. And he freaks out when he almost talks smack about his original like host family. Yeah. Um, which is and it's apparently not clear at this point what is just sort of like learned behavior on his part and what he might be actually compelled to be doing. Oh, like okay, later that makes on, we sense. sort of see that he can't say certain things. Like he tries to go into specifics and he can't. So at this point, we don't really know. You know, has he just mm. been like conditioned into into being so self-critical like what is normal for elves we don't know this is the first elf we're uh, meeting okay that makes sense that makes sense so basically dobby warns harry potter that he can't go back to hogwarts because there's a plot to do evil there um and harry's like no way hogwarts is the only thing that's good in my life i'm gonna go is it voldemort and dobby's like no it's not voldemort and but then he won't say who it is in fact dobby um, says he who must not be named and like he will do for the next four or five books harry goes voldemort yes harry <laughs> that's who we're talking about it's, i love it's, it is what it says dedication. on the tin don't name him <laughs> yeah i haven't gotten to the point in the book where they explain why they don't say it uh which i think my personal understanding thus far is that it's like the equivalent of like stepping on a crack but uh, right. I love that Harry refuses to say it. And also Dumbledore in the first book, like initially was like, cut that shit out. Yeah. Like just call him his name. So I'm on team. Call him his name. So he says, don't go back. He also reveals that he stole Harry's letters from Ron and Hermione Freaking and Daddy. Hagrid. Come on. So that makes Harry super upset. But then what makes him more upset is that Dobby tries to sabotage Harry going back to Hogwarts. So he like runs downstairs, levitates Petunia's big pudding. bowl of pudding and makes it crash all over the floor and makes it very apparent that A, you know, someone was upstairs and B, there's like magic afoot. So ruins the sale or I don't know if it actually ruins the sale or it almost ruins the sale. Basically, the Dursleys are beyond upset. It also ruins the punchline, quote, of my Japanese golfer joke, says Vernon Dursley. Oh, dear. Oh, oh dear. dear. I, I don't want to know any more about that. See, I really wanted to know what the punchline was. <laughs> I think you can piece it together. <laughs> so Dobby causes mayhem. Mm -hmm. 
the guests are, you know, startled and run up. They're like, uh, you have a secret kid upstairs? Oh, my God, he's ruining things. What's <laughs> happening? Um, and then an owl flies in, apparently just the open window. They don't have screens in no. England. That is true. Um, and and drops a letter because they think that Harry did the spell to levitate, to levitate exactly. the pudding. Which leads me to ask, did the, does the ministry just have owls everywhere? Like <laughs> Amazon distribution centers? Like just lying in wait with like, you know, various like parchments and, and people at the ready to send notes i don't know it came <laughs> very, very quickly it did come very quickly so uh basically he gets he gets locked up even more so which somehow is possible and yes like you said he gets with bars and a doggy <laughs> door come on come on that's a lot it's intense uh and then yeah he gets a he gets a nasty gram from the ministry of magic for being an underage wizard doing magic so then we get into chapter three the burrow so ron shows up in a flying car uh casual <laughs> amazing such a great image and just another like little nostalgic so you didn't experience the nostalgia of this being like an integral part of your childhood development which is fine <laughs> and you're enjoying it still um but for me like in my mind the shape and color and texture of harry's room is my room growing up like i just that was the only room did I you knew. have bars and on your window image, in your room <laughs> no but i had blinds uh, okay and so looking up out the blinds into the nighttime sky with the moon you know behind it and imagining the ford anglia hovering ring with uh, ron and fred okay. and george looking yeah. at me like i have almost a memory of that like my my imagination was so strong it feels like a memory um <laughs> so it's it's such a good image uh, uh, i think objectively and also to me this is why i love having harry potter fanatics on the podcast because everyone has deep emotional connections and then i just point out plot holes <laughs> I, I also took lots of notes about plot I'm, holes oh, and, and funniness i'm very glad that's good I try to, I try to, you know, play both sides here. A healthy balance, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yes, good friend Ron coming yeah. to check on Comes Harry. Comes to check on Harry. He's like, hmm, my letters go unanswered by this, like, flaky 12-year-old <laughs> that I just met nine months ago. I better go check on him in my illegal flying car. <laughs> With my twin brothers, who are the greatest characters in the whole series. With my prankster God, twin I brothers, love them. yeah. They tie up the bars to the car and, like, yank them off the window. And then George, uh, Harry's like, oh, wait, all my stuff is locked in the room. And then George and Fred are like, oh, don't worry, we know how to pick locks so they go and pick locks and get Great. his stuff and i'm like i love the twins so much i do too so they go they they do all that and then they they get in the car drive away at a certain point vernon though wakes oh, yes. up and, and tries to grab harry by the ankle again another like strong mm -hmm. image mm -hmm. like in uh like in matilda where they're like you know flinging the girl by her braids i was like oh wow it's it very, just made yes, a connection in my brain very um, dramatic escape. but like why why is Vernon so upset to see him go? Yeah. I, I would have thought he'd be like, great, if I could take him. Yeah, don't we don't care, want him don't around. I, I, I'm, What's I don't happening? know. They're very strange. They don't make much sense. So basically, the twins reveal to Harry that house elves can't do magic unless someone has been given orders to do so. So someone told Dobby to mess things up, and we're not sure who. Ron yes. and Harry think it's Malfoy, which means it's definitely not Malfoy. If we've learned anything from the first yeah. book, whoever Ron and Harry think did it didn't do it because they think it's Snape, not Snape. Now they think it's Malfoy, not Malfoy. Later, they think Malfoy is the heir to, to, to Slytherin. Salazar Slytherin. Definitely not. Yeah. And I, I talked about this with Charlotte in the last one, but it just they just followed the Scooby-Doo principle where they always have a red herring, <laughs> and then it's usually the first person they you do. meet. That's the air. So we'll see what yeah. happens. Uh, and and much like uh, in the in the classic American TV show House MD, Ooh. it's never lupus. In this case, it's almost never Draco. <laughs> yeah, never Malfoy, never Snape. Then uh, let's see, let's see. We go to the burrow. Yeah, the beautiful the burrow. burrow, the epitome of like motherly love and home and connection <laughs> and like surpoof, uh, sur Surpo whoa, and superfluous sur stuff. <laughs> I, I love it. And Percy is also acting. We kind of hear about Percy, yes. right? The, the prefect, the, the Weasley brother, um, acting very fishy. Yeah, I have quote, sending letters. I have quote, Ron says Percy's been weird AF sending a lot of letters. That is the note that I have Yeah, written and like down. wearing his prefect badge just around the house. Yeah. Like, we get it, Percy, you're a prefect. Yeah, he's just a super nerd. So they get home to the Weasley house. They're trying to sneak in because they've been out all night. But Mama Weasley catches them. No, and, no. She has seven kids. She knows what's up. Yeah, so she catches them, and then their punishment is they need to denome the garden. Some more cruelty. Yeah. Like, what a friggin' horrible thing. They're they're talking back to you. These aren't ants. No, and they, they just, like, have to pick <laughs> them up and throw them away, and then that's how denoming a garden works. Uh, awful. So awful. Ron, Ron takes him up to his room, and he's, like, nervous that Harry's not going to like the house because he's poor. But Harry's like, I love this. This place is perfect, and it's 
a big awe moment like just absolutely it adorable. is adorable we also learn about his dad arthur weasley yes. uh the the muggle artifact specialist <laughs> he's like an fbi agent who's also a serial killer in that like <laughs> he's supposed to be policing the misuse of muggle artifacts and yet he one knows nothing about muggle artifacts no, nothing and at all. two fucks with them in his spare time exclusively that is all he does in his spare time <laughs> we never see him doing anything except for playing with or asking about muggle objects oh, it's so true and it's beautiful I'm a big fan of the Weasley family. I just know that Ron and Hermione get together and then Harry and Ginny get together. Mm -hmm. And I was first sad about this, but after getting to know the Weasley family more and more, I'm so glad Harry gets to marry into that because they're the best. I totally <laughs> agree. And uh, as listeners do not know that I am a huge participant in fandom oh. um, and have been reading fanfics for, I don't know, 15 years. Um, so oh, wow. in, in fic... Even when, you know, we think through all kinds of possibilities, you know, writers will ignore canon, they'll put different pairings, you know, romantic pairings than there are in canon, you know, in the books mm -hmm. themselves. But something that almost everybody has in common is even if in their fix, Harry and Ginny don't get together or get divorced or something like that, Harry always has a great relationship with the Weasleys <laughs> because they like, they like have adopted him as a yes. son. And so I can't tell you how many dozens of fanfics I've read where it's like, and Harry still went to the Christmas parties because like he loves the Weasleys. <laughs> the best. I hope we get a sweater every year so chapter yeah. four at flourish and bots so uh the weasley house has a bunch of weird stuff in it mainly because uh papa weasley is fascinated by muggles and muggle trinkets so they've got that all over the place yep. um and Ginny uh continues her streak of being a huge fanboy of harry and being really nervous around him which i think is amazing given that we know that they get married just great times right. so um the kids get letters from hogwarts prepping them for the school year and apparently they need to read 87 books by some dude named gilderoy lockhart who seriously like one week before school yeah. come on people you know what classes they're <laughs> going to be taking like give them the freaking book list in june uh, gilderoy lockhart who i also don't know why he exists i'm sure he'll have some sort of plot implications but i just hope he's not the heir of slytherin but I don't know. My my guess, I'll I'll get into my predictions for who I think the bad guy ends up being. Okay. I know Gilderoy Lockhart's going to play some sort of role because all he's done so far has been an idiot. So he has to play some yeah. sort of role. It would be a choice to have it be the Defense Against the Dark Arts professor twice. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like that. Like either either it is or it isn't. <laughs> oh man. So. Ginny is starting her career at Hogwarts this year, so that's really cool. She um, is. Ron gets a letter from Hermione, and the three, the squad is going to go to Diagon Alley to get their books together, which is going to be adorable. That's the plan. So Ron and Harry uh, went up a hill to practice Quidditch um, because, you know, that's, that's what you do. Exactly. And Percy, meanwhile, has, like, been really busy, shut in his room all the Little time. Twat. And it's really... It's really confusing of what he's doing. And also, I'm all the way in Chapter 10, and they still haven't mentioned what's going on with Percy. So I feel like that's going to come into play later. I know. I know. Also, Percy is, like, 15. So, like, presumably some of his time is spent, uh, like, exploring. you know, whatever with, with himself. <laughs> uh, but he seems to be writing way more letters than is typical, even for a wizarding teenager. Yeah. So Bill, the oldest Weasley, we find out, lives in Egypt and is working for Gringotts. And coolest. And, and he was yeah. the head boy, which is a funny way to say valedictorian. Uh, <laughs> yeah, again, something else that as a kid, totally foreign to this American, uh, this American, <laughs> like until um, the sort of like school narratives. I mean, this is really the first like uh, boarding school book that I had ever read. And so the idea of a prefect and a head boy, like there wasn't the Internet. Like I went to the library and looked up in a dictionary what a prefect <laughs> was like my parents didn't know. So, I mean, there were so many little instances of like, what the fuck is a quill? Like, what is a head boy? And we didn't know. So good. They decide that they're going to travel by flute powder, which teleports flute. people. Oh, how do you spell it? I, I was reading. So I've been alternating between book and audiobook, And this portion, I was audiobook, So it's flu. Flu. That's how, again, that's how I've always pronounced it. It's <laughs> F-L-O-O -O okay. is how you pronounce it. Yeah. Also, really leveling up Harry's, like, trust of magic. So his first use of magic, you know, arguably was walking into a wall at mm -hmm. Platform 9 and 3 quarters. Now he's literally stepping into fire. So, yep. I mean, at this point, Harry's just, like, put his lot in with magic. He's like, I will, he's I like, will I'm take in. whatever you give me. I know. I'm sold. <laughs> so... So they do that, and they're like, don't worry, Harry, you've never done this before, but you'll be okay. You'll teleport fine. And he's not okay. He's not fine. He gets to teleport to some sketchy-looking pawn shop, and Where the Malfoys... his arch nemesis is. Exactly. The Malfoys are there. Uh, also, fun fact, I've been pronouncing Malfoy Malfoy the whole time. I thought that's what it was. <laughs> I don't know why. And then I was like, wait, it's spelled Malfoy. 
<laughs> yeah. I, I thought it was something. I don't know. Anyway, the Malfoys are there. Draco's really jealous of Harry and vocalizes this in front of his dad. I know. Papa Malfoy is selling stuff that he fears would be bad if the Ministry of Magic does one of the raids on his house yes. that they're conducting. So do you get what those are? Uh, n uh no. <laughs> so, so presumably, based on the information we have so far, uh -huh. it's the Ministry of Magic, right? Like the current government uh -huh. going to sort of do a little like, hey, buddy, what's up? Check in, pat down of former Death Eaters, Voldemort's uh, former supporters. Oh, so I get it. Lucius okay. is like a known, you know, in bed with Voldemort. Exactly. Not literally people. Figuratively. <laughs> and I mean, some fix you can find it. Um, <laughs> and it was actually really interesting. I've forgotten that this happened, uh, that he was like divesting himself of uh, you know, bad magical objects. Though, like, he lives in a mansion. Like, presumably there are some, you know, well-guarded rooms. I don't know. He's trying to sell off stuff, and he's being sketch about it. And, you know, as, as the Malfoys are, just constant state of being sketchy. It's also revealed that Malfoy got really bad grades, which I think is a great little note for J.K. Rowling to add. It's just like, let's throw or in some not, dialogue. not the best. I don't, it was not clear to me if it, they were bad or if they were just not, not number one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which, you know, if you're not first, you're last. Exactly. <laughs> so then Harry leaves after the Malfoys leave. And he's in yep. this like really sketchy looking alley called Nocturne Alley. Yep. Uh, and while he's there, he runs into Hagrid, thank God. Who calls Harry a mess, which is like, coming from <laughs> Hagrid, that's something. So he's like, hey, what are you doing here? And then brings him into Diagon Alley, which is a couple blocks away. And it's like a, a wonderful, like, orange lit paradise. Yeah, it's like perfect and beautiful and sunshine and rainbows. And then this other alley is like dark and moldy. So, you know, <laughs> there's no zoning laws in London, apparently. No, we just put all the, the dark, scary stuff behind the gate where the kids can't ah, go. Ah, I see. Conveniently. I see, I see. <laughs> so they get to Flourish and Bots, which turns out to be a bookshop. Uh, yep. And there's a ton of people there because Gildoray Lockhart is signing books. Gildoray, you've learned is a very attractive wizard that all girls really like but then you also learn is a huge douchebag so yes. he's signing books he's really excited to see harry potter because harry's famous um he brings harry up to the stage and makes an announcement that he's going to be teaching defense against the dark arts at hogwarts Whoa. Um, to which my thought is so this guy assigned his own books as reading i know such a vanity ploy <laughs> and then when i got to learn about the character i was like now everything makes sense everyone has the one professor who's like it's not mandatory but it's suggested that you read my monograph and oh, blah. Yeah, like yeah. Gilderoy lockhart just like here are my eight poorly named memoirs yeah, about my memoirs I that are all named with alliteration creatures? yeah <laughs> Like, what are you, Lemony Snicket? So uh, <laughs> so the, the direct quote that I had written down for this part was, quote, he assigned his own books. Are you fucking kidding me? Fuck this guy. I hope he's the bad guy, and I hope Harry Potter kills him. What a douche. <laughs> so hopefully he has a bad demise. But, but we'll after, after having to suffer through that scene, we do get uh, Ginny defending Harry against Draco. Yes. The first thing that oh. she really says in the whole series, actually, it, is, so is her being like, fuck you, Draco. I forgot the actual line, but it was so good. Like, Draco was older and rich and pompous. And, like, Ginny still just freaking stood up against him. Mm -hmm. I love it. Oh, no, it's so good. Because first off, Gildoroy's like, here, Harry, have a free copy of my book. And then Harry's like, oh, I already have this. Do you want this, Ginny? Right. And then... <laughs> it's like, you're not going to be wasteful. Here you go. Save some money. So, yeah, she gets a free book. Probably, you know, her heart explodes. And then, yeah, she defends Harry's honor against against Malfoy, who tries to talk smack. So it's beautiful. Yeah. That, um, is, that is one thing that I was, like, a little bit uncomfortable about is how much focus there is on, like, oh, you know, women, they just, like, fall under the spell of handsome men and they can't think about <laughs> anything. And Hermione is, like, drawing hearts, you know? And mm -hmm. uh, I, I forgive it. I forgive J.K.R. because she, at this point, doesn't know, I, I guess, how her books are going to sell. And, like, you know, there isn't that much room for nuance necessarily. Sure, but sure. Um, I was like, oh, that hits, you know, a little close to home. Definitely. Draco goes back to his normal bit of uh, making fun of Ron for being poor, which he needs to stop doing. Like this is we not a Draco. This is not playful. Like you're just a horrible human. Papa Malfoy talks smack to Papa Weasley about being poor. What is wrong with this family? Like what is the dad doing that he needs to be involved in his son's beef? <laughs> like, yeah. His 10-year-old, his 12-year-old son's beef. <laughs> He's like a pretty senior government bureaucrat. And I guess just the implication is like they have too many kids for the money that he's making. But like, yeah, that's I pretty mean, much it. 
surely, surely wizarding society has figured out like the social safety net. Like why, why are the Weasleys poor? That this is a question that I think about. Yeah. So <laughs> they fight, they knock over a bunch of stuff. Hagrid breaks it up and then they all go home. Then yep. we get into chapter five, the Whomping Willow. Iconic. Iconic. <laughs> yeah, when I got to this, I was like, oh, right, this is the tree that punches people. Yep. These, are, these are the things I remember from book two. So Harry is sad to leave the burrow because he really likes living with the Weasleys. Uh, he does. So they get into the magic modded car. They're running super late, which I can connect with. Uh, <laughs> and they try to jump through the wall of platform nine and three quarters, uh, but they just smack into the wall and they Terrible. miss the train. Again, Harry's literal worst nightmare that, oh, yeah. I'm going to wake up and my magic is going to be gone. Exactly. And my initial thought was, ah, oh, this has to be Dobby and then later you learn it is Dobby. Damn I forgot that it was Dobby I was like oh man what's happening here <laughs> well the thing is and I've, I've discussed this in previous episodes of the podcast is like I've been good at predicting things that happen and then I get happy and then three seconds later I'm like oh this is a book written for nine year olds <laughs> <laughs> I'm a 24 year old college graduate with I get it, yeah. advanced critical thinking skills I should be able to guess certain things. <laughs> uh, speaking of which though Ron gets a bad rap as like a bumbling fool um, just kind of in, in general terms, but he's very handy and resourceful here in yeah. like four lines. He's like, okay, this is a situation. This is the plan we're going to do. We're going to drive the car pretty well. He uses a <laughs> muggle compass. I was like, damn, yeah. like the Weasleys must have gone through like Boy Scout camp. <laughs> Clearly they have. So yeah, so like you said, they have to, they missed the train, so they have to get into the car. So they're like, let's just fly the car. My parents can just apparate home. Slash, in, in like a school of only eight or nine hundred people, like surely they can wait until everybody's on the train. Like this is the literal only way to Hogwarts. Yeah. Why are they just, oh, it's not Take attendance. Bye. Like right. there's one train. It's not like people take trains from multiple places. You have like, head they should... boys for days. Have someone take attendance for Christ's sake. Yeah, really. It just there's there's so many things at Hogwarts that seem to be confusing. <laughs> there's no infrastructure at Hogwarts. No, they they like really don't have anything together at all. They're like some grand wizards a thousand years ago came up with an idea. Let's just stick to that. Also, the grand wizards who all have alliteration names, they are not grand wizards. I know, <laughs> not a fan. I know. They were like, Very yeah, uh, Olga Bumpkin Slice. Sorry, you're not going to work here. No, you're not going to. But you know who is Sal Slytherin? Like, yeah, <laughs> you have alliteration. <laughs> Anyway, um, and in the age of startups, actually, it's really interesting. I wonder what what as a, as a thought exercise we would name all of these people. Like salsa, it would be like Slytherin, <laughs> and Ro Ro Marino wait Ravenclaw Ro Ra. Anyway. So yeah, so they, they take the car, they get to Hogwarts, but they, they it runs out of magic just in time to crash into the Whomping Willow. Slash, how do they survive? Whatever, it's fine. That, nothing <laughs> is said about airbags deploying, but nope, nope. They, get, they get beat the hell out of by a giant tree that punches you. No, yep. no broken bones or anything like that. So they run away. The car like ends up flying away. They have like the Spider-Man agility factor here. Like their yeah. agility is very high, even though their strength is very low. Mm -hmm. So they see that the sorting ceremony is going on and they don't see Snape. So they're like, oh, I, they're <laughs> like, I wonder if Snape is like not teaching here anymore. And then Snape's like, oh, he's right behind you. And he's right there. <laughs> it's perfect. Boom, kids. Yeah. yeah. He's like, he's like the dramatic villain in a, anything that was like waiting behind a door and be like, ah, oh, like waits, exactly. for, the, waits exactly. for the perfect moment. <laughs> and I love that these 12 year olds like look at the teacher's table. I cannot recall until I was about 18, even thinking about the adults in the room. Like everything was about, you know, me and my problems and my friends and the fact that they like like looked up and like hmm, let me count our staff members <laughs> this is very interesting <laughs> to me Snape's not there so they miss the sorting ceremony because Snape grabs them and scolds them and basically they do puts them into what's going to be detention. And the big reason is that a bunch of muggles saw them in a flying car, which is a big no-no. Can't let the muggles see that people can do magic. No. So he brings in McGonagall and Dumbledore, which is my first concern of why when everything serious goes down, they only bring in the Slytherin head, the Gryffindor head, and Dumbledore. No one cares about well, the heads of Hufflepuff or Ravenclaw. That's true. I, I mean, I think, uh, you know, the sort of construct is like the Slytherin people are out to get him. So like frequently it's the Slytherin people who actually, you know, are trying to enforce this infraction. Um, and then McGonagall as their as their house head. She's the head of, Grif of Gryffindor. So, you know, she is sort of there to to determine their uh, their punishment. But yeah, Dumbledore, like, what does he do to administer this school besides like <laughs> hang out and decide individual punishments for individual students? <laughs> Pretty, apparently that's all he does. They go in and basically Snape wants them to get expelled. They don't. They're just given detention. 
Um, and like a nice little picnic lunch on McGonagall's desk. Uh, yeah. Slash, I still don't get iced pumpkin juice. That can't be no. good. No, it sounds really bad. Really, no. really bad. So they go back to the, the Gryffindor dorm and everybody's like, holy shit, you guys flew in on a flying car? That's so cool. Coolest and kids of the semester, yeah. Yeah, everybody loves them except for Percy and Hermione because they're the biggest goody-goody two-shoe know-it-all nerds. <laughs> Which kills me because like J.K. Rowling is a nerd. Like she loves to read and she was good at school. So to have this being like, oh, Hermione's so bossy and she's in homework. Ugh, so lame. Like, <laughs> sort of like, oh, come on, give me something. No, I think she just tries to make herself seem really cool, um, which is why she just, like, associates herself with Gryffindor and never talks about Hufflepuff. She's like, they're lame. So, anyway. Uh, <laughs> so, Ron and Ron and Harry, like, feel guilty, but they're also, like, pretty stoked that everyone thinks they're the coolest ever. Uh, oh, and then I had in parentheses, they wonder why they couldn't get to Platform 9 and 3 quarters. I bet it was Dobby, that little shit. So, yeah, my I prediction the, stands correct. I bet it was the person who, two weeks ago, enforced, like... <laughs> near criminal isolation on this 12 year old for the summer exactly so then we get in chapter six gilderoy lockhart and i was like oh great this will be a wonderful chapter <laughs> it's named after the guy i hate so i would rather follow draco malfoy around hogwarts and like just read insults for 20 pages than read more about gilderoy lockhart yeah maybe what a fuck boy <laughs> so it's mail time uh ron gets uh -huh. a howler which is just a yelling letter. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and Hermione... Those Hermione, are pretty cool in the movies. Those are pretty cool in the movies. <laughs> yeah, no, I do remember that, and that was cool. Hermione is nice to them after they get the howler, because she's like, good, you got in trouble like you deserved. Which I'm choosing to read as her concern manifesting. Like, she might not be, you know, sort of uh, assertive or emotionally intelligent enough to talk about, like, hey, I was worried about you guys. Um, slash her best friends are two boys, so why would you say anything about feelings? Um, you know, so maybe she's just uh, her manifest concern that way but they're also literally bandaging the whomping willow which i thought was yes. so funny that's that's what my next sentence was the whomping willow has its branches and slings which <laughs> doesn't seem like that's how trees work it's so <laughs> so funny slash like when has the linen bandage ever been useful after the civil war <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, in a land of wizards, uh, they can heal bones with a spell. Right, but they can not, regrow your arm, but, but not, not a tree. <laughs> yeah, uh, but this this little this little vignette I read a few times because it was so good, um, including Lockhart being what I now know in my 2016 vocabulary to be the ultimate mansplainer. Uh, quote, I quote: "Just been showing Professor Sprout the right way to doctor a whomping willow." Oh, okay. So you're going to show the herbology professor of several decades at like the premier wizarding educational establishment in the world how to bandage a tree thanks Gilderoy Lockhart <laughs> professional celebrity oh yeah he likes to do that a lot it's a very common it's, theme it's great though <laughs> like as, as bad as the character is it's it's hilarious every yeah. time so it, it happens actually in the next part because they go to he does. Uh, herbology with Professor Sprout, very conveniently named, and uh, Lockhart's just awful. He takes Harry aside, and he thinks that he inspired Harry to do the flying car into Hogwarts thing because he's yes. like, oh, you got a taste of the limelight, didn't you? And he's like, no, I just so had to get funny. to school, and this was the only way to do it. Harry doesn't say anything, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so they're working with mandrakes in class, which are apparently very important in spells and return people to normal. I am assuming they will come into play with Polyjuice Potion later on. Sort um, of the, the mint of, uh, of wizarding plants. You know, it's good to have on hand when you need it. Apparently the way that mandrakes work is they scream really uh, loudly uh, and they're just baby heads instead of roots. That are fatal when fully grown. Yeah, that which sounds is terrifying. like a plant that shouldn't exist. <laughs> yes, a cry that will, quote, knock you out for hours until they grow up, then they will kill you. Why are 12 year old children working with potentially uh, murderous plants? <laughs> I don't know. Slash, this is a kid's book, and it's pretty awesome that the stakes are, are this intense, you know? Yes. So, uh, so then there's this guy named Justin Finch Fletchy, an Eaton boy. An Eaton a what? boy. Eaton, which Eaton. is like the the fancy snobby um, private school in England, where all the like prime ministers and bankers and like sons of lords go. Uh, Benedict Cumberbatch went there, among other you know people of of note. Uh, and w when I read his name for the first time, I was like, hmm, I don't actually know much about him because like there are there are these sort of like secondary characters in the various houses, the other people besides like the trio and Draco, um, you know who you who you don't really have a strong impression of and mm -hmm. as soon as she named 
dropped Eaton, like that is a signal to all readers of British descent. Uh, oh, this guy is like a, a our equivalent of like a waspy high class like douchebag. Ah, fun. Yeah. So uh, he talks about how great Lockhart is, which to Ugh. me is super suspect, and I really I think know. he's really think it's someone bad in using Polyjuice Potion to pretend to be a student. That's my hmm. that's my hot take. Uh, yeah. Is that he's going to turn out to be a bad guy of sorts? Then you also get uh, Colin, who's a uh, his name is is his name Colin Creepy? It's Creepy. Creepy. Which is, okay. Which is a little on the nose, JKR. <laughs> Again, it is for children. It is for yeah, children. Yeah, it's for kids. So <laughs> Colin Colin Creepy, who's very creepy. He's a scrawny little Gryffindor first year who just really wants to take pictures of Harry and follow around Harry. Uh, and he's so Harry's awkward. number one fan. Yeah. Also suspect AF. Super gonna play some sort of factor. Also might be evil. Who knows? I don't think he is though. Um, uh, but he does facilitate another great Lockhart moment, which is uh, Lockhart giving Harry fame management advice. Uh, ah, yes. The quote is, I covered up for you back there with the young creepy. If he was photographing me too, your schoolmates won't think you're setting yourself up so much. Like he covers for Harry to make yeah. him look more humble in the eyes of the students. Ugh. Like, Ugh. Ugh. and you can it's tell so too awful. that, that Lockhart is like, Oh man, this kid's going to grow up to be something. Let me like get in with him oh, now. Yeah. You know, 100%. like it's totally self-serving. Super obvious. So Lockhart uh, d- has his first class and he starts it with a quiz about how much they know about him, about which me. is just great. <laughs> it's just a quiz solely devoted to him. There's no good answer here, right? Like for a normal person, if you know too much, it's creepy. If you don't know enough, it's insulting. But I guess for Lockhart, you, you can never love him too much. No, impossible. Definitely. So uh, all of his books are titled with alliteration. Uh, yep. <laughs> so just why awful. not? <laughs> um, and then he tries to teach a class where he unleashes pixies on the class. So uh, bad. What a terrible idea. <laughs> they're destroying everything. And he's like, what? You guys can't deal with this? And they're like, no, we're children. Uh, and then he's like, fine, I got it. And then it doesn't work. So and then by, I got it. He leaves and says yes. to the trio, figure it out. He yes, he leaves and is like, oh, uh, hey guys, uh, you, on the job training is good, and just closes the door behind them and is like, Enjoy figure it out. This well planned pedagogical exercise. No, Lockhart, that's not how it works. Yeah. <laughs> also, like as as a as a foil or as a counter example in Charms class and in Transfiguration class, like you see over time they build up in tiny baby steps. Like especially in the previous book, you mm-hmm. transfigure a button, you transfigure a feather, you transfigure a fly, and and here Lockhart is like. Here are some pixies. Goodbye. <laughs> Classic. So Hermione tries to defend Lockhart. She's like, no, he was he's good because she, you know, is a girl. So loves him. Uh, and Ron is like, I bet this guy is a fake, which is also like every boy's thought. So just exactly. very stereotypical things where all all men hate attractive men and all yes. girls love attractive men. Uh, but again, sort of the flashing back to the, the first, you know, read experience again as a nerdy kid who inhaled 300 page fantasy books. Um, <laughs> I, I definitely identified with this impulse to cling to grownups like as a, a certain kind of kid, you're just not like intellectually stimulated by other kids your age and so any adult who's willing to talk to you you're you like grab on with two hands and so (laughs) in a way i can see how hermione is like okay new professor like interesting sort of nearer to my age than like the the octogenarian professors that i know um so you know i i definitely see that um and he's dreamy he is a little bit dreamy and i put in my notes uh dumbledore must really be scraping the barrel to bring in the celebrity (laughs) to teach like the thing that dumbledore cares the most about which is defense against the dark arts. Like there yeah, were no they do a background available? check or something. Yeah, couldn't Nothing. they? Couldn't they like test if he's good? <laughs> Bring someone's dad. Like isn't, anything. Isn't there like an application process? Uh, I, apparently not. <laughs> uh, okay, so this is actually this is going longer than I expected, but this is good. So we're gonna we're gonna cut it here, cut it at chapter six, and then we'll pick it up again in the next episode for chapter seven through ten. But thank you so much for joining, Amanda. I really appreciate you being here. My absolute pleasure. <laughs> much like Hermione, I over prepare for uh, <laughs> very small things. So uh, sorry for talking to you for two hours no, about the first ten chapters great. of this a was, children's book. This was amazing. <laughs> I'm really happy about it. This is great. So yeah, if uh, internet, if you want to go follow Amanda on various social media, it's She's So Mickey. And if you want to follow along her podcast, it is Spirits Podcast. That's it. For all good stuff. All right. See you next time. See ya. Potterless was created by Mike Schubert. It is hosted by Mike Schubert. It is edited by Mike Schubert. It is produced by Mike Schubert. And the music is by Bettina Capamanes. You can follow us on iTunes and SoundCloud. And if you rate us on either of those platforms, that would be absolutely incredible. Also, you can find us on Twitter at Potterless Pod. Thanks so much for listening, and I hope everyone has a happy Thanksgiving.